In 2010, we passed a very important landmark, one that maybe most people didn't see, but us in the foodie world did. And it was the moment when more people on the planet became medically over, seriously overweight or obese than became hungry. So there is no question that we don't have enough food. It is a political issue. So now we're in a world where we have 1.9 billion people overweight or obese. We have one in 12 adults with type 2 diabetes and 42 million children who are overweight. In China, there are 122 million type 2 diabetics, and they've managed that in 25 years. There is so much food, and yet we still have 800 million with too little to eat. So starving in that way is a political issue. And closer to home, diet is now the biggest risk factor to health in the UK. Obesity, type 2 diabetes, costs the NHS 15p in every pound that is spent. 66.4% of men are overweight or obese, 57% of adult women. One in four kids start primary overweight, one in three leave that way. Last year, there were 7,000 amputations due to diabetes and another horrific stat, which always sticks in my mind, I don't know quite why I didn't write it down, but in Vietnam in 2015, they chopped off more limbs than they chopped off at the height of the war. The main reason children under 10 go into hospital to have anaesthetics is because they're having teeth out. Well, I could go on. I'm not going to go on. You get the picture. But it's also about poverty. And a lot of politicians have been shot out of the water by making that comparison. And they said, oh, so you can't say that. But actually, it's true. 31.3 of adult women in the poorest households are obese versus 19.8 in the richer ones. It's a big divide. So 20... And one more stat to give you, 25% of kids eat no vegetables at all. Yet, eating five portions of fruit and veg, we know, cuts cancer risk by 14% a day. Why aren't we doing something? Hello. So what about the environment? Right now, our food system contributes a third to greenhouse gases. And new report from Chatham House, I'm lucky enough to have a wonderful person from Chatham House on the food board called Laura Wellesley, who runs all their food and environment programs. They come up with a new recent survey, and OK, our needs on electrical energy and power sources are going down, but if we, don't, if we carried on farming and eating and producing in the way that we do by 2050, food will account for 75% of global emissions. And as Dan and I were talking beforehand, and I think maybe we'll talk a bit later, that is both a threat and an amazing opportunity, as I think we can make clear. But food growing, it's the primary reason we cut down the Amazon. And the primary reason for that, and Indonesia, is to grow crops that feed animals that don't feed us. The largest, the three largest seed companies control 75.3% of the seed market, and the pesticide country, companies are not far behind. Um, and it's no surprise for instance, that we're losing all our pollinators. The bee colonies in the US have dropped to their lowest in 50 years. They are only fractionally better here. And according to the UN's, UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, 60% of calories and proteins now come from three crops. They come from corn, they come from wheat, they come from rice. That's it. That makes us so vulnerable. And 90, nearly 90% 90 of all fruit and veg depend on, and lots of other things, depend on, again, going back to the pollinators. In the US, bee activities across from apple orchards and pumpkin patches, they generate, if you do true cost accounting, 15 billion pounds a year. But I don't know how many of you have seen that image in China where they have used pesticides to destruction. You now have Chinese workers hand-pollinating apple trees with paintbrushes. They're being bees. It is extraordinary. 70% of all the fresh water in agriculture has a, uh, is used... 70% of all the world's fresh water is used in agriculture. And closer to home, the Professor Tim Benton, who's on the Government Environment Commission, says that if we have a series of droughts, East Anglia could be a dust bowl in 10 short years. And yet, despite that, at all the, Paris, at all the climate talks, food is still on the margins. Um, We've been sold, you know, if you think about most of the snack food that's out there, it has 
almost no nutrition in there. We've been sold this dream of snacks on demand, of food you don't need to cook, and the vast machine of all the sweet and salty products that our bodies crave. And they do crave, because we're still in the same phase of evolution. Although I know people don't really like to think it, but we're still, we've still got a hunter-gatherer body, which is what we learn every time we learn something about the microbiome. But we, on a sort of more community level, sales of dining room tables have plummeted. People don't eat. People don't get together as families or as groups of friends. I mean, yes, this is changing a bit, but in large parts of the community, it's snacking in your bed, it's eating this kind of junk food. So it's a mess, in my view. It also makes me furious, because you see what this does to kids, to inequality, to this vast machine that makes so much money out of something that I believe should be in the common good. So what do we do to change it? Um, it's incredibly difficult because, as I said before, food's everywhere. It's not a single thing. But what I think is encouraging is the fact that diet, what we eat and how we do it, drives so many things as getting up the political agenda. And the scale of this task is dawning on those who monitor and explore the nature of food's impact on society. We need, in short, though, we need a revolution. We can't just tinker at the margins. And it's very important, I think, to say that there is no one thing. There's not necessarily any one right thing. What there are is a huge group of things. And we have to work at all levels. In London, we do an enormous amount of stuff at a community level, which maybe if you're sitting in number 10, might seem rather abstract. That down there on the ground in Balham or somewhere, there's some amazing community projects which are food growing and feeding people and helping school kids and doing all those things. But actually, if we get movement at the top, we have to have the bottom working in order to join it up. So we need these things. We need all these levels. Cities are very cool and powerful places to try to affect it because sometimes I feel you're like this. You have the ground on one level and you have the government at the top. And in the end of the day, there is an army of amazing people, probably all of you, who know that you do sort of change the world one meal at a time. 